On this slide, we see the number of organic structures. As it turns out, quinine, which was discovered in 1854, the actual connectivity of the structure of the organic molecule wasn't determined for 54 years. And even then, they weren't really sure. Uh, later, with the introduction of modern instrumentation, this was confirmed structure of quinine. Uh, in those days, they determined structure by a combination of chemical degradation of pure compounds and synthesis of uh, known samples that can lead up to it. Uh, and it was a very laborious process. But even in the 1960s, determining structure was was still somewhat difficult. Uh, penicillin was discovered, and it took a number of years, I believe it was around 20, 25 years, to determine the structure. And it wasn't determined definitively until Dorothy Hodgkins was able to get crystals and get an X-ray crystallograph of uh, those crystals, and this turns out to be the structure for penicillin. But even very good Nobel Prize winning chemists proposed structures that turned out not to be correct. Now it is much easier uh, with modern instrumentation to determine organic structures, but let's let's talk a little bit about that. So let's consider this molecular formula C two H two F two. Just from the molecular formula, I can tell you something about the possible structures for this compound. As it turns out, there's more than one possible structure for this one. And in fact, we can easily draw three structures. Here we have them here. And notice that hydrogen and fluorine are, come, are atoms that only have one bond in most organic structures. Uh, so they, they have to be terminal. They're only bonded to one atom. But carbon can be bonded to more than one atom because it can have four bonds. So each of these carbons is bonded to two atoms and another carbon. And as it turns out, that other carbon has oops, a carbon-carbon double bond. But we can have both hydrogens bonded to the same carbon and both fluorines bonded to the other carbon. Or alternatively, we can have a hydrogen and a fluorine on each carbon, but even there we have two possible structures because the carbon-carbon double bond does not allow free rotation. So we can have the two fluorines on one side of the double bond, or we can have a fluorine on each side of the double bond. And these are, as it turns out, are two different compounds with different chemical uh, properties. So we can get some information just from the molecular uh, formula, but not a lot. You might ask yourself, how do we determine molecular formula? Uh, there's lots of different ways. There's lots of methods to do so. Uh, years ago, they one of the most common methods for determining molecular formulas was to combust the materials with an excess of oxygen. And if they were organic compounds, uh, they would get combusted to give water and carbon dioxide as products. And then if they also had oxygen, you could get the percent oxygen uh, by difference. So we can determine um, empirical formulas quite easy. But in order to get a molecular formula, you need to know the uh, molecular weight. But how would we go about determining the empirical formula from a combustion analysis. So here we have a sample, 2.37 grams of a sample, and the percent composition of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen were determined. Uh, now what we would do is we would simplify this and we wouldn't necessarily use the 2.37 gram sample. Once we know the percent composition, we could just assume a 100 gram sample. That simplified things greatly. That tells us in 100 grams, we would have this much mass of each of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Then we would have to simply divide each of those masses for the individual elements by their atomic mass so that we could get the number of moles in a 100 gram sample. And that tells us the relative molar amount of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In a way, that gives us an empirical formula like this. That's not convenient because we know that we cannot have partial atoms in a molecule. They have to be whole atoms. So we would have to convert this to a whole uh, number uh, relative amounts. 
the easy way to do that would be to divide each of these by the smallest molar amount. In this case, it happens to be oxygen. If we divide each of these by 1.54, we get uh, one oxygen atom for every approximately seven hydrogen atoms and three and a half carbon atoms. Still, we don't want half atoms, so we're going to have to double that, and we get an empirical formula, C7H14O2. Now, we don't know just yet uh, if that is the molecular formula for a compound, because it could be some integral number of these units in the molecule. To get the actual molecular formula, we would have to know the molar mass of our compound. There's lots of ways to determine that. Here's some ways you learned about in intro chemistry. Uh, you're going to learn about another method uh, in this module known as mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry can give us a mole molecular mass, which we can then use to determine structure. So once we know a molar mass, if we didn't have a formula, we can, we can know that there's possible formulas. And an easy way to do this is to use what's known as the rule of 14 to generate a hydrocarbon molecular formula just from the molecular mass. And we do that by taking the molecular mass and dividing it by 13. We'll end up getting a quotient, N, and a remainder. I know you folks typically use calculators, uh, but that decimal, that represents a remainder. And we can use both the quotient and the remainder to determine the molecular formula for a hydrocarbon with that molar mass. And it would just simply be the number of carbons, N, which was our quotient, and the number of hydrogens would be N plus R, which is our quotient plus our remainder. That gives us a hydrocarbon structure. Now, we might have other uh, elements in there, and we could figure that out. Let's say, for example, we had oxygen in this compound. We'd have to replace the mass of oxygen, which is 16, we'd have to take away uh, atoms that have a mass that equals 16. So in the case of carbon and hydrogen, if we were to put oxygen in this molecule, uh, we would have to remove one carbon and four hydrogens to make up for the atomic mass of oxygen that we're putting into it. And we can do that with any elements. We just have to make sure. So let's do an example uh, using this rule of 13. So generate a possible molecular formula for a compound that has a molecular mass of 106. So we take 106 and we divide by 13. Now 13 goes into 106 eight times. Uh, 8 times 13 is 104. We would have a remainder of 2. So n equals 8, r equals 2. That's the remainder. Uh, our molecular formula then for this compound would be C, N, H, N plus r, which gives us C, 8, H, 10. Now let's say that we knew we had at least one oxygen atom in there from a, a combustion analysis. Uh, we could then put an oxygen in there by removing a mass of 16 in form of CH4, throw an oxygen. Both of these have a mass of 106. So that's just an example. Now we have to be careful when we're using this rule of 13 to make sure that our, our formula makes sense. So here's another example. Use the rule of 13 to calculate a hydrocarbon structure for a compound with a mass of 102. So in this case, we have 102 divided by 13. And we can go in there seven times. 7 times 13 is 91. That gives us a remainder of 11. So N equals 7. R equals 11. We use our C, N, H, N plus R. We get C7, H, 18. And this, I'm afraid, 
this nonsense. If you don't believe me, try and draw a molecule with seven carbon atoms and 18 hydrogen atoms. You just can't do it. The maximum number that you could have for a complete hydrocarbon is CnH2n plus 2. So C7, the maximum amount of hydrogen you could have there is 16. You couldn't have C7H18. So this is nonsense. You would have to uh, either put another carbon in and remove 12 hydrogens so that you would have C8H6. That's not nonsense. That is a possible chemical uh, that we, we could draw structures that have eight carbons and six hydrogen atoms. So the rule of 13 is something that you'll often use because you may be given a molecular mass and you have to generate some possible uh, molecular formula from that molecular mass. So be ready to use that. So once our molecular formula is known, uh, we have we can start generating structures, but we could generate a lot of structures. So we want to know some other information. For example, uh, are there any double or triple bonds? Well, we can actually figure that out from just the molecular formula, as we'll see momentarily. But what other functional groups might be present? Do we have a uh, carbonyl group? Do we have carboxylic acid groups? Do we have carbon-carbon double bonds, carbon-carbon triple bonds? Do we have uh, carbon-nitrogen double bonds? So one of the things that you folks learned last semester was uh, how to use IR spectroscopy. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But just from the molecular formula, we can learn something about the molecule and its degree of saturation. Now, a simple hydrocarbon that is completely saturated with hydrogen would have a molecular formula of CxH2x plus 2. So the example we used earlier, if we have seven hydrogens, we could have up to, I'm sorry, seven carbons, we could have 16 hydrogens, that would be heptane. Uh, there's lots of different isomers, but that is a completely saturated molecule. If we have just two carbons, we could have C2H6, and that would be ethane. But what if we have C2H4? If we have C2H4, we know that we have to have carbon-carbon double bond, and it has what we call an unsaturation number of one. That unsaturation number just means that we have to remove uh, one molecule of hydrogen in order to form that carbon-carbon double bond. So we had ethane, which is completely saturated. Ethene has an unsaturation number of one. It has at least a double bond or a ring. You can't have a ring with a two carbon system, so it has to be double bonds. Here we see an unsaturation number of two. That means we have at least two double bonds uh, or a ring. And again, we only have two carbons. Now, when we have a ring, we also have an unsaturated system. We typically think of unsaturated systems as having double bonds, but they could also have rings because we have to remove two hydrogens. This has a molecular form of C6H12, a completely saturated compound with six carbons could have up to 14 hydrogens. Uh, and you can see here we have a ring and three double bonds, so we have to give an unsaturation number for each of those features, one for the ring and one for each double bond, Benzene has an unsaturation number of four. You can actually determine this just from the molecular formula. There's different ways to do it. Uh, you can use this formula, in which case C represents the number of carbons, N represents the number of nitrogen, or actually phosphorus, trivalent atoms, and X represents the number of monovalent atoms, such as hydrogen and halogens. Okay, so if, for example, with this thing, we could throw each of those into that formula and determine the unsaturation number. Now, there is another way to do it as well. For example, here, we can determine this quite easily because we know that 
a saturated compound with eight hydrogens could have up to, I'm just, a saturated compound with eight carbons would have 18 hydrogens. So this is missing eight hydrogens divided by two is four. It has an unsaturation number of four. As it turns out, oxygen doesn't appear in this equation up here. We don't see oxygen. That's because Oxygen doesn't change the unsaturation number because it's divalent, and we don't have to worry about divalent atoms. So we could figure this one out. C7 would have a maximum number of 16 hydrogens, and we could have an oxygen in there. We're missing 10, so this has an unsaturation number of 5. What about this one? Well, we could plug it into our equation, in which case we have 2 times 10, which is the number of carbons, plus 2, plus 2 for the nitrogen, and we then have to subtract from that the monovalent atoms, in this case that's 14, all of that divided by 2, so that simply gives us 20, 22, 24, 24 minus 14 divided by 2 equals 5. So we could determine that as 5. There are other ways to do this as well. We could, uh, uh, it's a little bit tricky with nitrogen, uh, but you can think of other ways to generate that unsaturated number. Now what does that mean? Again, it means the number of rings and the number of double bonds. So let's take a look at some of these molecules that uh, exist in nature and figure out the unsaturation number simply by looking at the structure. This first compound has two rings in it, so we have to have uh, an unsaturation for each of those ring systems, and we have two double bonds, so this would have an unsaturation number of four. Now we have to be careful with counting our rings because there's two rings in this, but you could think of, you could also count the total thing as a ring, so you, 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 you have to be careful about counting the rings. This is an easier compound. There's simply two double bonds and there's no rings. So here the unsaturation number equals two. In this compound, notice we have we can easily see one, two, three rings, and then we have this bridge position. We think of that as another ring, so it's four rings. And we have one, two, three, four double bonds. So this would have an unsaturation number of eight. And down here, again, we have to be careful counting the rings because we have a six-membered ring here. Uh, we also have two five-membered rings, but we really just have a bridge compound, so we think about it as a two-ring system. And we have another ring over here, which is three, and we have three double bonds, so our unsaturation number here is six. Now, you can count up. Uh, alternatively, you could just count all of the carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, whatever, and throw them into your equation that we had back there uh, as well. So... How do we solve structures? Well, we use the molecular formula. We determine the unsaturation number, and I suggest you always determine the unsaturation number. It greatly helps you in determining organic structure. As soon as you know the unsaturation number, there's you can eliminate a number of structural possibilities. So the next thing we want to do is probably take a look at different spectroscopic techniques and figure out what kind of functional groups we have in our molecule. So uh, we make fat fragments. We think about making a jigsaw puzzle. So let's say we knew the molecular structure and from different forms of spectroscopy, we could account for all of these different functional groups. Uh, we're now able to put this together. Now this doesn't mean that there's a carbon there. We're indicating here that we just have carbon oxygen and that thing has two places that can be bonded. Here we have a phenyl group and that can be bonded to one thing. Oxygens can accommodate two bonds. So we put this thing together and here is a possible structure here. Now there could be other structures as well. We could put it together slightly differently so we would have to make sure that this structure coincides with the other evidence that we would have. What other evidence might we have? You've already learned about IR spectroscopy, and from IR spectroscopy, you can gain functional group information. Here we see an IR spectrum of a simple alkane, and 
This tells me that I have nothing but CH bonds that are bonded to an sp3 hybridized carbon. Recall that sp3 hybridized carbons have absorptions that are less than 3,000. If we have an sp2 hybridized carbon that's bonded to a hydrogen atom, they appear around 3,100. And if we have an sp hybridized carbon bonded to a hydrogen, we will see uh, absorption at 3,300 wave numbers. Uh, this gives us some functional group information. For example, if we have a simple alkane, all of our CH absorptions are going to be below 3,000. If we have something that appears somewhere around 3,100, might be slightly more, slightly less, uh, we know we have at least one carbon, carbon double bond because, or a carbon oxygen double bond, but we have a hydrogen that's bonded to an sp2 hybridized carbon. If we have an sp3 hybridized carbon that's bonded to hydrogen, we'll get an absorption around 3,300 wave numbers. Recall that IR gives you a lot of functional group information. Uh, out here, we generally get information about hydrogen bonded to different atoms, carbon, oxygen, whatever. Those absorptions appear uh, out around 2,800 and beyond. When we have absorptions in this region, it gives us information about uh, double and triple bonds and uh, carbon attached to hetero atoms. And we talk about this as being the fingerprint region. Now, you've already done some IR spectroscopy. Uh, this tells us where the different absorptions happen. For instance, I can look at this compound, uh, and I can tell you that that is probably due to a carbon-oxygen double bond. I can't, from this spectrum, tell exactly where it is, but I might be able to tell whether it was a ketone. Uh, it's not an aldehyde. Um, there, there's other information that would tell me if it was an aldehyde, uh, it's probably not a carbon-nitrogen double bond, uh, but you, you become familiar with that. And that helps you put together structures. Uh, so that's all we're going to talk about right now in this introduction. We're going to take a look. You, we will not be looking at ultraviolet spectroscopy. It gives us information, but it's not terribly... Uh, helpful in structure determination. Infrared spectroscopy is, and you learned about that last semester. The first thing we're going to talk about is mass spectrometry, and later in this module we're going to be talking about nuclear magnetic resonance.